All right. Okay, we have a new camera. We have a new camera. Okay. And I went for a walk, and I'm feeling better. And I'm insane. I'm deaf. I've anyway. This is the mop up for April fifth, twenty twenty four. I'm David Feldman coming to you from Manhattan. Please like this episode so I remain in your feed. The big eclipse is Monday. I'm told like I care. I live in a Manhattan air shaft. Every day of my life is a solar eclipse. Well, I am feeling better. We have a new camera. I got some sun. And uh, I don't get that excited about eclipses. The Washington Post reports this morning that before, during, and after the eclipse, keep an eye on your pets because they're going to act weird. Like if you have a cat, it might actually be glad to see you. I remember in a previous life in Los Angeles during a solar eclipse, my service dog Lenny got on my laptop logged on to Thor and began downloading some really nasty Romanian pit bull porn. Long story short, that was the end of marriage number four. Anyway, keep an eye on your pets during the eclipse. They can do some weird, weird things. Shocking news. Andy Cohen from Bravo, the genius, who's given us all these great Real Housewives programs that have elevated our national consciousness. He is now accused of bullying, unfair labor practices, misogyny, racism, and harassment. Where would somebody get an idea like that about Andy Cohn? I mean, other than watching Bravo. The charges are being leveled by former stars of the Housewives. Well, this is shocking. Andy Cohen seems like such an, em- such an empath. I-, I can't imagine Andy Cohen taking any delight in pitting women against each other, plying them with drinks, and then letting the cameras roll. I don't see any of that when I watch The Real Housewives. I see genuine, authentic couples grappling with the human condition. It's like Ibsen. It's like I'm watching Ibsen and the side effects of excessive Botox abuse. Well, I hope Andy Cohen is going to be okay because he exudes grace. Kind of like Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, who hasn't talked with President Biden in a month because, you know, Netanyahu's been busy. Biden on Thursday warned Bibi Netanyahu during a phone call that further support of Israel is contingent upon the safety of civilians in Gaza. According to a White House readout, our president really let Bibi Netanyahu have it. He he said, Bibi, unless you stop killing innocent women and children, I'm warning you, I'm going to threaten to issue a threat that we might stop selling you weapons in the near future. Biden said that. He said, I'm not bluffing. Unless you agree to an immediate ceasefire, I am going to issue a full-throated threat that my administration will issue a formal warning that you are running the danger of my eventually getting around to thinking that maybe America should stop selling you fighter jets and missiles. Meanwhile, Donald Trump was on the radio yesterday where he said of Gaza that Netanyahu has to get it over with already, unquote. Trump said, why? Because the optics are bad. Yes, that's the first thing all of us think to ourselves when we see video coming out of Gaza. Boy, Netanyahu's optics are really bad. Trump refused to say whether he still supports Israel 100%. You might remember right after October 7th, Trump trashed Benjamin Netanyahu. He called him weak. He said he couldn't be trusted. And why did Donald Trump say that? Because Benjamin Netanyahu called Joe Biden to congratulate him for winning the presidency. Trump accused Bibi Netanyahu of disloyalty. This was 
like the day after 1,200 Israelis were murdered, women raped, hostages taken, and Trump immediately (laughs) said Netanyahu is a bad guy, a bad guy for one reason, he wasn't loyal to Trump. Netanyahu seems to be getting the message about the bad optics. He announced that Al Jazeera, one of the best news organizations, I mean that, in the world, Al Jazeera is a great news organization, but Benjamin Netanyahu said Al Jazeera will no longer be allowed to report from Israel. That's repairing the optics. Oh, uh, yeah. The entire world community is condemning Israel. Even Israel is condemning Israel after aid workers from World Central Kitchen delivering food to Palestinians were killed in Gaza by Israeli strikes. World Central Kitchen had coordinated all its movements with Israeli military. They were clearly identified, and yet the strikes happened anyway. In a rare display of humility, Netanyahu said the Israeli military took responsibility for the killings and insisted it wasn't intentional. William Burns, America's CIA director, arrives in Cairo tomorrow to begin talks on a ceasefire that would be contingent upon Hamas releasing the hostages. So the head of our CIA has been sent to conduct diplomacy in Cairo because in the Middle East, nothing screams honest interlocutor more than the words director of the CIA. Yeah, Sure, let's trust the American agency that gave the Middle East waterboarding, dark sites, Sivak, and the Shah of Iran. The CIA is doing diplomacy now. Burns is the head of the CIA. He warned that Iran is about to strike Israel in response to Israel's attack on the Iranian embassy in Syria, which killed three senior commanders and four other high-level military advisors, and Iran is furious because that was their embassy. And all of us who were alive during the Carter administration remember how sacrosanct embassies are to Iran. Speaking of things that are not kosher, doctors at Massachusetts General Hospital transplanted a pig kidney into a 62-year-old man's suffering from end-stage bacon addiction, as well as kidney disease. But we have good news. He got a clean bill of health, and he was released from the hospital with his brand-new pig kidney. As for the kidneyless pig, nonstop dialysis, kind of sad. And we don't know the name of the patient with the new pig kidney, but he went into Massachusetts General, a clean freak. This is what his bedroom looks like after one day home from the hospital. He went into Massachusetts General. He was Felix Unger, got the pig kidney, came out Oscar Madison. I think he's got a malpractice suit. This is the front of his house. This is what his house looks like after getting the pig kidney. The neighbors are trying to be patient since he is a patient, but the guy's been home two days with a pig kidney. Look at what, actually, this is (laughs) from a house in the Fairfax neighborhood of Los Angeles. They call it the trash house. Have you heard about (laughs) the trash house? It's in a neighborhood of Los Angeles where homes sell for $3.5 million. You know, the hood. That's, you know, in the hood, you can, if you're lucky, you can find a house for $3.5 million. Actually, it's right near Beverly Hills. Look at all that trash. Look at it. It's like a casting call for one of Andy Cohn's shows on Bravo. According to reports, the owner... (laughs) Refused to empty his trash for eight years. Hey, we've all been there, right? Uh, I was there last week. You saw what I look like. I feel you, brother. I feel you. But let me tell you something. This is why you never buy a home. You scrimp, you save, and you end up with (laughs) this guy for a neighbor. 
don't buy a home. I have a son who doesn't recycle. He, li- he might be living in that house for all I know. He said to me, recycling is performative. He's a slob and a leftist. And he says, whatever we do from, you know, separating bottles from paper or taking mass transit, he says, it's just a drop in our ever increasingly acetic ocean. All of the greenhouse gases, my son said, come from 10 companies. He said, there's nothing you and I can do to offset the carbon they spew into the atmosphere. Well, a new study out on Thursday says my son is wrong. It's not 10 companies responsible for all the greenhouse gases. It's 57, Wilbur. I call him Wilbur from Charlotte's Web, the pig. Anyway, 57 companies are responsible for all the greenhouse gases. No matter what you do, if you turn off your lights, doesn't matter. You cannot offset what these 57 companies do to the planet. They are responsible for all the greenhouse gases, and it's your usual suspects. BP, Exxon, Shell, Exxon, 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 and Roseanne Barr's queefs. But this is the genius of the fossil fuel companies' crisis management teams, right? The crisis isn't global warming. To them, the crisis is Exxon getting blamed for global warming. So they they tell us to turn off the lights, turn down your air conditioner, get an electric car, separate paper from plastic. It doesn't mean anything. They're just keeping us busy so we blame ourselves for the planet. It has nothing to do with us. It's the fossil fuel companies. Keep it in the ground or all of us will be in the ground. Speaking of toxic garbage, Donald Trump's truth social stock closed on Thursday down more than 5% after tanking 27% on Monday when investors looked under the hood and couldn't find the engine. The stock is just a hood, and that hood is Donald Trump. And I don't mean hoodlum, I mean foreskin. Trump is so pathetic, he's not even a dick. He's he's the useless foreskin. Barry Diller ran ABC, and then he ran Paramount, and now he invests in media companies. On Thursday, Diller called Trump's new stock offering a scam. He said anyone who buys that stock is quote-unquote a dope. Language, Barry. Language. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was, I shouldn't have quoted him. The uh, Trump stock is still selling in the mid to low 40s, which means on paper Trump is worth several billion, but the nanosecond he unloads the stock, it will lose all its value. Plus, as majority shareholder, Legally, Trump can't sell during what is called a six-month lockup period. And by then, he'll be worrying about lockup periods that last way longer than six months. Trump has now been ordered to be deposed in the civil suit filed by the original founders of Truth Social, who are now suing the ex-president. Are you sitting down? They claim... He ripped them off and made it impossible for the original founders of Truth Social to benefit off the merger that created last week's stock offering. Trump ripping off his two business partners. They should consider themselves lucky that they're not staring down the barrel of 20 years in prison. You do business with Donald Trump, just be grateful You're not looking at time. Trump will be deposed for this lawsuit in Manhattan on April 15th. And April 15th is going to be a busy day for the rapist. It's April 15th, which means Trump has to remember not to pay his taxes. 
And that's also the day the rapist goes down in history, becoming the first American president ever to be tried in a criminal courtroom. Trump is charged with forging documents and defrauding the government when he hid hush payments to porn star Stormy Daniels in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election. He's juggling four criminal trials, plus he's trying to appeal the half a billion dollar judgment against him in that New York State civil fraud trial. He's trying to appeal the $83.3 million judgment against him in the lawsuit filed against him by E. Jean Carroll after a jury ruled he raped and then defamed her. And then there are countless other lawsuits, like getting sued by the founders of Truth Social. Last week, the New York Times reported since leaving office, Trump has spent at least $100 million dollars on legal fees all paid for by his MAGA moron donors. Trump fought the law and the lawyers won. On Wednesday, the judge in the Manhattan criminal trial smacked down a motion by Trump's attorneys to postpone the trial until after the Supreme Court rules on presidential immunity. The judge admonished Trump's attorneys, telling them they had weeks to file this motion. It's way too late. The trial is happening. Then his lawyer said, well, uh, how about freedom of speech? Shouldn't the trial be dismissed on First Amendment grounds? And the judge said, you're thinking of the trial down in Georgia. That's where you're supposed to argue freedom of speech. And Trump's attorney said, oh, right, thanks. And then they said, well, what about dismissing these charges based on a different reading of the Presidential Records Act, which would allow ex-presidents to wave an imaginary wand over classified materials and declare eeny, meeny, chilly, beeny, these war plans with Iraq and Iran are public domain. And the judge said, no, 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 that's the criminal trial down in Miami. And, And Trump's attorney said, right, 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 right. Well, then, Your Honor, I guess it's just going to be more bomb threats phoned into you and your daughter's home. That's literally Trump's legal defense. I will kill you. That's his legal defense. Any other criminal defendant would be spending weeks in jail for violating gag orders. But Trump's lawyers go before the judge and insist Their client didn't violate any of these gag orders on account of, if you lock him up, he will have you killed. Well, as if Donald Trump didn't have enough to worry about, last night, bedbugs at Mar-a-Lago announced they have joined forces with SEIU, the Services Employees International Union, and will petition the NLRB for the right to engage in collective bargaining. The bedbugs at Mar-a-Lago have unionized. They're demanding cleaner sheets and time and a half whenever Rudy Giuliani or Steve Bannon have a stayover. Meanwhile, President Biden's fundraising hall gets bigger and bigger as Trump's donations from small town, small time, Low information MAGA morons are drying up. The MAGA morons don't seem to be donating the way they they used to. Donations from Trump's brain dead supporters are down nearly fifty percent from the last election cycle. Even MAGA morons have figured out if you donate to his presidential campaign, the money is going to pay his legal fees. So he's not raising the kind of money that Joe Biden is. And, you know, politics in America, thanks to Citizens United, is all about money. In 2016, Donald Trump didn't need cash because of all the free publicity he got from the networks who would literally interrupt their new ca- their newscasts to show an empty microphone where a crowd of Trump supporters were waiting for Trump to speak. Remember that? 
Well, Trump is getting way more coverage now than he did in 2016. He's getting more free publicity now than he got in 2016, but not the kind of publicity he wants. Meanwhile, Biden has raised twice as much as Trump, which means while Trump is busy canceling rallies, he's literally canceling rallies because he can't afford them, Biden has already begun pummeling the airwaves in swing states with ads calling Trump broke, weak, and he's fat shaming. They are fat shaming. The Biden administration or the Biden campaign is fat shaming Donald Trump. If you live in a swing state, you know what I'm talking about. When Biden talks to us, when he talks to the nation, we see a kind and avuncular middle-class Joe, Amtrak Joe. But the ads being run in the battleground states are vicious. They would be defamatory if everything they said weren't absolutely true. A new Franklin Marshall poll shows Biden surging ahead of Trump in Pennsylvania. Since the State of the Union, Joe Biden has shot up 10 points in Pennsylvania. And as I keep reminding you, Biden won five states that Hillary didn't. Those were Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, and Arizona. He needs to win Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Then he gets to 270. If he loses, say, Wisconsin, he has to win either Georgia or Arizona again. Not both, just one of them. But now, thanks to Republicans running a homophobic, Holocaust-denying, Martin Luther King trashing candidate for governor in North Carolina, and no, it's not Donald Trump, they're running Lieutenant Governor Robinson, probably the second worst candidate running in November. Because of Lieutenant Governor Robinson, North Carolina might be in play, as is maybe Florida, thanks to the Florida Supreme Court this week ruling that Ron DeSantis' six-week abortion ban can be on the ballot in November. They're going to vote on a six-week abortion ban, basically, in Florida come November. That's not good for the Republicans. Here's the thing about these nasty Biden ads that are playing in the swing states. They're designed to do two things. One is to get under Trump's skin. These ads are reminding voters incessantly that Trump is poor, which he is, that he couldn't come up with a half a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars for the settlements, that he paid hush money to a porn star after having sex with her while Melania, his wife, was recuperating from the birth of their son. These ads are making fun of him for being out of shape, cheating at golf, Anytime Donald Trump refers to Nikki Haley as Nancy Pelosi or calls Joe Biden Barack Obama, which he keeps doing, they grab the clip and they flood the airwaves in these battleground states calling <laughs> calling Donald Trump demented. If you read Trump's Truth Social, and nobody does, these attack ads are starting to get under his spray-tanned skin. And the other things these ads do is they shock middle America because Joe Biden is a nice guy. He's gentle. You expect Trump to be mean. You know, after a while, though, Trump mocking Biden loses its currency because just like Kevin Sorbo and those residuals from Hercules, it's all he's got. And you can rely on not telling the truth only so long. I mean, that's basically how Republicans run for office. They lie. 
CNBC is the Wall Street Journal of cable television. CNBC covers the stock market. It is a cheerleader for capitalism, Wall Street. Everyone on it is a Republican or a Republican pretending to be a Democrat, somebody like James Kramer, but they're Republicans. They're pro-tax cuts for the rich, and they are most definitely and decidedly anti-union. This is from CNBC. Headline, Biden tells U.S. Biden tells us, no, Biden says U.S. economy is world's best. Trump calls it a cesspool. Data is clear. Oh, so the data is clear. So Biden is saying the economy is the world's best, but Trump is saying our economy is a cesspool. CNBC is going to tell us what the data says. And the data is clear. According to CNBC and every respected economist, Republican or Democrat, under Joe Biden, America's economy is the strongest in the world. We have the lowest unemployment and the lowest inflation of all the industrialized nations. Our stock market is setting new records. And here's what some of them, some of them were saying over at CNBC. The reason we're doing so well is because when Biden took office, like FDR, he pumped money into our economy. The CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. These are all jobs bills. It's not cutting taxes for the wealthy and racking up $8 trillion of debt the way Donald Trump did. You cut taxes for the wealthy, the CBO, everybody says it doesn't create jobs. The, the wealthy just hoard their money and the government racks up debt. But these spending bills, this fiscal stimulus, created good paying jobs with Wages that are outpacing inflation. And you know what happens when inflation, when unemployment is down? A lot of my listeners posted this on my channel and I read it and, and a lot of you, it was, it's brilliant. I didn't come up with this. They did. They said, when unemployment comes down, so does our crime rate. Crime spiked to its highest levels, the highest levels in 20 years during the last year of Trump's presidency. It's now, under the Biden administration, plummeting. Of course, not, you know, the, the crime Trump and his cronies keep committing uh, is spiking, but the rest of us are keeping our murdering, our raping, and, and our assaults down. Uh, which is surprising considering how much we all want to kill one another. But crime is down because unemployment is down. Thank you to my listeners for pointing that out. More bad news for Trump. He can't run on the economy unless he lies. He can't run on crime unless he lies. But his ace in the hole has always been this imaginary migrant crisis. Now, CBS reports they've gotten their hands on new Department of Homeland Security numbers, which show that in March, border agents caught 137,000 migrants sneaking into the country. That's down from 141,000 in February. This marks the first March in seven years that border crossings have dipped. And CBS says much of the decline can be attributed to Biden cooperating with the Mexican government and the Mexican government cooperating with the Biden administration. You don't have some lunatic like Donald Trump sitting in the Oval Office talking about a wall that Mexico's... Anyway, uh, so this poses a problem for Trump. Going into November... He can't run on abortion. He refuses to say anything about Lindsey Graham's proposed 15-week national abortion ban. 
And as I always say on this show, whenever I need gynecological advice, I always turn to Lindsey Graham. So he can't run on abortion. He can't run on the economy. Every poll, this is interesting, we've talked about this, every poll shows that Americans, especially in swing states, Americans say their personal finances have never been better, but they believe America's finances are a disaster. That's going to change. Americans are going to wake up. So he can't win on the economy. All Donald Trump has is what he's always had, and that is tertiary syphilis and racism. Uh, He continues to lie about crime. Why? Racism. It's all he's got. And crime is racism. Law and order is racism. Ever since 1968, the, the Southern strategy, Nixon and Pat Buchanan talked him into this. Nixon ran as the law and order candidate in 1968. And ever since then, Republicans have tried to win over racists in the South and all over America who were disenchanted by Democrats pushing through the Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 65. That's what Republicans have been doing since 1968. They win over Southern racists, all racists, by portraying themselves, Republicans, as tough on crime. Street crime, not corporate crime. And by tough on street crime, they, they're talking about black men, especially Nixon and Reagan and Trump. Law and order is a racist dog whistle. So Trump has to lie about crime. He has to say Biden is soft on crime. And he, he scapegoats the migrants. That's more racism. This is all he has. He's got his tertiary syphilis, and uh, he scapegoats the migrants because they're people of color who don't speak our language. He portrays them as criminals. Now he's calling them animals who are poisoning our blood. That's how he's running. Be afraid of black men. Be afraid of the migrants. They're terrorists. That's what he calls them, terrorists. Why is he doing this? Because as Bill Clinton once pointed out, Republicans have learned to win by getting Americans to vote their fears, not their hopes. But you can't win an election running as a white supremacist, which is what Trump thinks he can do. Or maybe he just can't control his racism. Now, you can win heavily read congressional districts as a white supremacist, Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, you could run a fire hydrant and it would win uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. Probably be much smarter and have less dog piss on it. But you can win a heavily read congressional district as a white supremacist. But every swing state, in a, you know, we're talking about a national election, every swing state, Arizona, North Carolina, Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, did I mention Michigan? They have way, way too many people of color. Trump cannot win these swing states on racism. There aren't enough racists. Uh, He can't win on racism or the attendant dog whistles of crime or the migrant crisis. Crime and the migrant crisis, it's not going to seal the deal for Trump. As Jason Aldean has proven, racism will only get you so far. Then again, Shane Gillis got to host SNL, and he's racist. Did I mention that Shane Gillis is racist? Read Seth Simons. If you haven't read Seth Simons, 
I strongly urge you to read Seth Simons, S-I-M-O-N-S, Seth Simons. He writes for the Daily Beast, all the great magazines, websites. He also has a sub stack that you should subscribe to. It's free. Uh, I subscribe for the premium. He's, I think he's one of the best writers out there. He has a sub stack entitled uh, Humorism. Actually, I don't think it's on Substack, but just Google humorism, H-U-M-O-R-I-S-M. It's uh, a comedy newsletter. He covers uh, extremism in the comedy industry, how uh, the the myth that comedians, uh, that political humor can only be liberal. There is this enormous racist, conservative comedy industry, especially here in Manhattan. Uh, You should read Seth Simons, S-I-M-O-N-S. It's uh, humorism. I think it's on the ghost. I just think you just type in humorism and you you will be amazed. He he watches these podcasts. He's got Shane Gillis dead to rights on the racism. So read Humorism if you're interested in comedy. It's a newsletter about labor, inequality, and extremism in the comedy industry. And he's got the goods on Shane Gillis. You read his coverage of Shane Gillis and the stuff that he has said, racist. You know, who, who he's, you know, you get racists learn how to talk in dog whistles, wink, nod, talk out of both sides of their mouth. Anyway, racism is all Trump has, and tertiary syphilis. But, uh, and he got to, just like Shane Gillis, he got to host SNL after uh, Trump called Mexicans rapists, and he got an invitation to uh, host SNL. Interesting. Anyway, between now and November, because all he's got is racism. Trump is going to get worse and worse with the racism and his surrogates. Once Stephen Miller, once these people start going on the talk shows, they're going to say one horribly racist, homophobic, misogynistic, anti-Arab, anti-Semitic, anti-LGBTQ thing after another. This is why the Washington Post reports this morning that one out of five Republican primary voters didn't go for Trump. Now, you compare that to Biden uh, in the Democratic Party. What you have right now are two incumbents, Trump and Biden, running for re-election. That's what we have. Nobody has come close to challenging Joe Biden. He has run into the uncommitted voters in Michigan and Minnesota who withheld their votes to protest Biden's silence in Gaza. And Biden has gotten the message. There's no question that Joe Biden has gotten the message. And if you think it's going to be better under Trump, Trump is telling Netanyahu to finish the job already in in Gaza. And you, and you know what that means. Joe Biden, anyway, I want to be careful what I say. Uh, so the resistance that Joe Biden, and by the way, I, you know, withholding uh, the uncommitted, I support that now, not in November. I, I think I, th- I thought that was beautiful. It, it scared the hell out of Biden. That's the that's democracy in action. His pivot in the Middle East has been magnificent. So it works when you withhold your vote. Not in November, though. Uh, the resistance that Biden is facing is nothing compared to what Trump is facing in his own party. Uh, Let me go full screen here, if I can. This is from today's Washington Post. And let me just, how do I do this? Let me read this to you. 
While President Biden continues to cede votes as well, largely protests over his Gaza war policy, reflected in choices like uncommitted, Trump is ceding more. Since Nikki Haley dropped out of the campaign after Super Tuesday on March 5th, an average of 17% of those voting in GOP contests have voted against Trump compared to 11% against Biden. If you exclude low turnout caucuses and deep red southern states, Trump is ceding an average of 20% since Super Tuesday. So that means the people coming out to vote in the primaries, hardcore Republicans, 20% of them are not voting for Donald Trump. Since uh, 1988, Republican presidential candidates won the popular vote once in 2004. Republicans don't win, and we were at war, supposedly, Iraq. Uh, Republicans don't win national elections. They win through gerrymandering, disenfranchising people of color and the poor by lying about fictitious voter fraud. They use the, this lie about voter fraud to make it impossible for Democrats, basically, to vote. It's why Republicans detest the simplicity of mail-in ballots. They want to make it harder for people to vote. Republicans can win national elections by working the Electoral College on a granular level. They even sent phony electors to Washington on January 6th. I mean, they really work the Electoral College. They work the system by breaking it. They know, you know, if you can't win the game, change the rules. Nebraska is a reliably red state, but in presidential elections, unlike every other state except Maine, Nebraska is not a winner-take-all. It's proportional. So in 2020, Biden was able to pick up one electoral vote in Nebraska. And because Maine is also proportional, not winner-take-all, Trump was able to pick up one electoral vote there. On Wednesday, Nebraska Republicans, on orders from Donald Trump, tried to sneak an amendment into a totally unrelated bill that would have turned Nebraska into a winner-take-all state. It failed. They couldn't pass it. But had that passed, Biden would be down one electoral vote going into November. No labels pretends to be centrists. They, they're the problem solvers, same people. Many of the no labels people are neoliberal hacks from the Democratic Party who think working with Republicans means giving Republicans everything they ask for. No Labels was trying to run a third-party candidate this year. They failed. They approached Joe Manchin. He toyed with the idea, and then he demurred, uh, like anyone would have voted for that lump of guano. Liz Cheney was toying with the idea, and she said no. Kirsten Sinema was approached, like anybody would vote for her, she turned it down. Chris Christie and even Nikki Haley were asked to run on the No Labels ticket. They said no. And now No Labels announced on Thursday they will not be running a third-party candidate, to which I say to the people who run No Labels, what you should do now is go F yourself. No Labels, like... That's a good thing in the age of Trump. Donald Trump is a Nazi. That is his label. And Nazis put labels on all of us. So in this age of labels, there's no room for moderates or centrists. Donald Trump is a Nazi. 
the Republican Party is morphing into full bore Nazis, which means middle of the road makes you half a Nazi. And there's no such thing. As I said on the show earlier in the week, Liz Cheney warned that history is watching. Right now, history is judging us all. And I agree. But it also means history is judging Liz Cheney. Now, I don't approve of her politics. Her father's a war criminal. But since January 6th, God bless her. Okay? Now, you're right. History is watching Liz Cheney, which is why you need to endorse Joe Biden. In fact, Chris Christie, you need to endorse Joe Biden. Nikki Haley, you need to endorse Joe Biden. Mitt Romney, Asa Hutchinson, all the people, all the Republicans who say they're not voting for Trump, you all need to say I'm voting for Joe Biden. You need to say, I'm not abandoning my core conservative principles, but this is World War II. We're fighting Nazis. This is a national emergency. You need to set aside your, your, your core conservative principles and embrace your love of country and say, I'm voting for Joe Biden. Because history is watching. And like I said, Trump is going to lose in November. And there is going to be a political, legal, and financial reckoning for the people who didn't step up. Not, I'm not threatening physical, I'm t- but there is going to be a cultural backlash. You know? Who were the collaborators? Look at what the the shaved heads in Paris after it was liberated. The the Vichy the way the Vichy government and Marshal Patan were treated. Uh, that's what I'm not saying we should do that, but the collaborators must be held to account as in legal, financial ostracization. People need to be punished for not standing up for America. Peter Tunguet, what a perfect name for a writer from the American conservative. Peter Tunguet, T-O-N-G-U-E-T-T-E, And we all know where that tongue is. Uh, It's right on Donald Trump's uh, nasty place. He writes for the American Conservative, and his latest is entitled Trump 2028. He is calling for a national amendment that would allow Trump, after winning in 2024, to be able to run for a third term. Let me... Go full screen here. This is from Peter Tunguet. As the primary season has shown us, the Republicans have not moved on from Trump. Yet the 22nd Amendment works to constrain their enthusiasm by prohibiting them from rewarding Trump with re-election four years from now. More from Peter Tunguet. The case of Donald Trump, however, makes an even more forceful ethical argument against the 22nd Amendment and for its repeal. If a man who was once president returns after a series of years to stand again for the office and prove so popular as to earn a second non-consecutive term, as Trump seems bound to do, to deny him the right to run for a second consecutive term cuts against basic fair play. If by 2028 voters feel Trump has done a poor job, they can pick another candidate. But if they feel he has delivered on his promises, why should they be denied the freedom to choose him once more? Why? 
because they're Nazis. That's why. So we're looking at a large swath of the Republican Party that wants to create the illusion of elections. They, 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 they try to make it look like Trump uh, will win a fair election with no cheating. They'll accuse the other side of being the thieves. And this is how republics die, in the service of the ruling class who prop up fools like Mussolini, Hitler, Franco, and Trump. On the brighter side, John Bolton, who served in the George W. Bush White House, I think he was U.N. ambassador, I'm not sure, Uh, but he also was in the Trump White House. He served as national security advisor. He says Donald Trump is too stupid to be a dictator. I disagree. Trump's too stupid not to be a dictator. Dictators are not smart. Viktor Orban isn't smart. Putin isn't smart. Ruthless, murderous isn't smart. It's just diabolical. And if you have cowards, the evil people with sharp elbows often win. Think about your work. Think about the people who get ahead where you work. Are they better than you? Are they smarter than you? They want it more than you. And many of them are diabolical. Many of them are sociopaths. Doesn't mean they're smart. Well, speaking of diabolical, we're learning more about Mr. Hankey. Don Hankey, Mr. Hankey. Not to be confused with Mr. Stanky, who runs AT&T. Mr. Stanky runs a That's Mr. Stanky. He's a guy, got to be the head of AT&T, but he wasn't smart enough to change his last name. If you're born with the name Stanky, you change your name. This guy, Stanky, is probably so stupid... Uh, actually, he shortened it from Stanky on my hang dam. That was the full name of the CEO of... Uh, <laughs> Jesus. I'm insane. Oh, boy. Anyway, we're learning more about Mr. Hankey, Don Hankey, the billionaire who posted the $175 million bond for Donald Trump in the New York State civil fraud judgment. Mr. Hankey is reportedly worth $7 billion. He has earned the bulk of that fortune lending money to people with bad credit. You know, like Donald Trump. According to reporting this morning in the New Republic, Mr. Hankey ran afoul of the Consumer Financial Protection Department when Mr. Hankey was caught using illegal intimidation tactics to collect on delinquent loans, especially car loans made to U.S. service members who he reportedly threatened and harassed into paying him back, paying these exorbitant loans back. In violation of the Service Members Civil Relief Act, Mr. Hankey illegally repossessed at least 70 cars belonging to American service members serving our country, keeping us safe. But you can bet that Mr. Hankey wears an American flag lapel, supported the invasion of Iraq, tells us he loves our troops. Mr. Hankey was forced to pay close to a million dollars in restitutions. He also had to pay $44 million in restitution payouts. This is all according to the New Republic. Uh, There was a previous settlement before that. The government caught Mr. Hankey resorting to illegal threats and intimidation and lies in order to get his loans paid back. The New Republic reports that Mr. Hankey made the bulk of his fortune offering predatory predatory subprime loans 
to low-income people with bad credit so they could purchase cars. With subprime loans, the customer is offered a teaser rate. That's subprime. He's subhuman, the loan is subprime. It's low, but when the borrower when the borrower least when the borrower least expects it suddenly the interest rates blow up to biblically usurious interest rates and there are exorbitant fees and fines attached to any late payments these loans are designed these are predatory loans they're designed to keep poor people or American service members in perpetual cycles of debt, turning what seemed at the time to be a $5,000 used car, turns the $5,000 used car into, over time, a $15,000 purchase. This is how you get to be Mr. Hankey with your $7 billion. That's why New York... State Attorney General Letitia James, uh, she won the nearly half a billion dollar judgment against Trump. He had the bond reduced, but after he loses on appeal, which he most certainly will, Trump's going to have to come up with nearly $600 million. Mr. Hankey told ABC that Trump was able to put up all cash as collateral. Of course he was. Why would Mr. Hankey lie about something like that? I believe him. I believe Mr. Hankey. But New York State Attorney General Letitia James, she doesn't believe Mr. Hankey. And she filed a motion with Arthur N. Gorin, the presiding judge in the case. He's the one who leveled the half a billion dollar fine against Donald Trump. In the attorney general's, the state attorney general's motion, she asked to see exactly how Donald Trump's bond was collateralized. Mr. Hankey's company is not in New York, so he may not even be allowed to post that bond. And the New York state attorney general wants to make sure the bond is legitimate. In other words, when Trump loses on appeal... She wants to make sure Mr. Hankey will pay the state of New York. That's how it works. After Trump loses, Mr. Hankey pays New York, and then Trump pays Mr. Hankey. And then what was the the bond was $175 million, and then he's got to pay $600 million, Minus 175 million. 175 million of the 600 million comes from Mr. Hankey because he posted the bond. And then I can't do the math. 325 million? Am I even close? Now I can't concentrate. 325. 600 million minus 175 million. 500 million. 475? I'm doing this live. I think it's 475. 425. Help me out here. Anyway, sorry. Trump has to then cough up whatever 600 million minus 175 million is. And uh, so attorney, sorry about that, Attorney General Letitia James in her motion said basically that while Mr. Hankey is worth several billion dollars, his company has got several companies. And the company that posted the bond may not be financially sound. And like Donald Trump, Mr. Hankey is protected if and when that company goes bankrupt, and that could mean he'd be leaving New York State on the hook for the $175 million bond. According to new reporting this morning in Forbes, Mr. Hankey's company, now again, he has several. Donald Trump has 400 
shell companies in New York State alone that we know of. Uh, Hankey's company, the one that posted the $175 million bond, uh, the company notified, it's an insurance company, it notified policyholders who had policies with his company, they were notified that the company currently has assets of $138 million. Insurance companies are legally required to reveal to their policyholders how much they have, what their assets are, and what they owe. They need to be able to prove that they can make payments on claims. But, as New York State Attorney General Letitia James points out, if the company says this week it only has $138 million in assets and it had to post a bond of $175 million for Donald Trump, that added liability of the $175 million bond for Trump suggests that this company is just as, just as underwater as Donald Trump is. So on Thursday... Judge Arthur N. Gorin, who uh, leveled the half a billion dollar fine, he agreed with New York State Attorney General Letitia James, and he has now scheduled a hearing for April 22nd to determine if Donald Trump's bond from Mr. Hankey is properly backed. Well, let me save everyone a lot of time. It's not. We know it's not. That will be April 22nd. Donald Trump will be in a Manhattan courtroom to talk about how he collateralized the bond. Could this be more fraud? We'll see. That's April 22nd, which also happens to be when the Supreme Court hears oral arguments on presidential immunity appearing before the Washington, D.C. Circuit Court on the immunity issue. Trump lawyers said a president can order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate his political opponent, and there's nothing our criminal justice system could do to punish him after he leaves office because he has absolute immunity. Just something President Biden might want to keep in mind should the court rule in Trump's favor. Down in Miami, Donald Trump is on trial for violating the Espionage Act by keeping classified documents. Violating the Espionage Act by keeping classified documents hidden from our FBI after he left office. And then he would let visitors to his Bedminster, New Jersey golf club, view those documents, including war plans with Iran. Yes, these were stored in the bathroom at Mar-a-Lago, but for some reason this idiot liked to travel with his boxes, and he would carry classified (laughs) material that he'd like to wave at the Bedminster, New Jersey Golf Club. Uh, Anyway, the judge in that case, Eileen Cannon, was appointed by Trump, so she's been slow walking the trial, prompting special counsel Jack Smith this week to almost go over her head and ask the 11th Circuit Court to remove her. Uh, But Judge Cannon delivered a blow to Trump on Thursday, She turned down his request to throw out the case after his lawyers argued that the classified documents were his personal property and not the United States government's. When when, uh, we drew up, when when the Pentagon drew up war plans with Iran, uh, that was for Donald Trump personally. It's for him. She said no. 
She said, even I can't say yes to that. The judge in Trump's election interference RICO trial, so he's got, he's on trial in Miami for violating the Espionage Act and in Fulton County, Georgia, there's a RICO trial for racketeering. And, uh, And we're worried that he might actually win in November. Am I freezing up here with this new effing camera? Am I freezing up? I am so effing sick of technology. They can't wait to sell you something. And when it doesn't work, nothing. Uh, I'm going to go back to the old camera. Why does everybody else get to have a show where the camera works, the lighting works, and I don't? Woe is me. God damn it. I'm looking at myself right now. Uh, what was I talking about? Now I'm angry. Um, is, is, am I freezing up? No. Okay. Maybe I'm do, doing an impersonation of Mitch McConnell. You never know. The judge in Trump's election interference RICO trial rejected a motion by Trump's attorney on Thursday to toss out that case. Trump's attorneys, along with the attorneys for co-defendants Rudy Giuliani, who's an attorney, and John Eastman, who's an attorney, they're the attorneys for the attorneys argued that the First Amendment protected their right to protest the results of the 2020 presidential election. This is their defense. We were merely protesting the results of the 2020 election. Judge Scott McAfee ruled that the First Amendment doesn't protect a defendant uh, from what they've been charged with, which is ordering people to make false statements as well as forge documents and misrepresent facts in a government setting, like testifying before the Georgia State Legislature, all of that is against Georgia state law. Trump's attorney said he is weighing his options after Judge McAfee refused to toss the case out. Trump's attorney said he is considering appealing the judge's decision on First Amendment grounds. Really? Trump's, they're going to appeal. You know, um, it's not a First Amendment issue. If I order someone to commit a crime and they commit that crime based on my orders, that is not protected by the First Amendment. Either is phoning in bomb threats. That's not protected by the First Amendment. But since Trump has hundreds of millions of MAGA morons still willing to send him money, uh, his lawyers will appeal. This is what $100 million in legal fees gets you. You can delay justice. As I pointed out, ExxonMobil, it took 20 years before they paid the fishermen from Prince William Sound. Earlier in the week, one of the co-defendants in the Georgia RICO trial, lawyer John Eastman, lost his license to practice law in the state of California after the California State Bar stripped him of it, of his license. They cited, quote, the moral turpitude he displayed in the lead-up to January 6th when he urged Vice President Mike Pence, not to count the votes. That was after January 6th. There are reports that Eastman was calling Mike Pence after the insurrection 
and telling him, don't count the votes. By the way, I have a correction. On the last show, I said John Eastman is 60. He's 63. My apologies. He's 63. But he looks pretty great for 63, doesn't he? Uh, Anyway, he's a busy man. Yesterday, Eastman said he's been ordered to testify in a civil lawsuit filed against Donald Trump by Capitol Hill police officers who say the former president is personally responsible for instigating the January 6th attack. Another civil lawsuit. In late December of last year, an appeals court ruled that the police officers could sue Trump for civil damages. Eastman has been subpoenaed in this trial, as have all his correspondence with President Trump, which Eastman says, quote, blows through executive privilege. I think Monica Lewinsky did that as well. Eastman accused the Capitol Police officer's lawsuit of being politically motivated. Rudy Giuliani has had his law licenses suspended in D.C. and New York. He's also filing for bankruptcy after being ordered to pay $148 million to two Georgia election workers he defamed. Rudy has been ordered to sell his $3.5 million Florida condo, which he doesn't want to do. U.S. bankruptcy judge Sean Lane on Thursday in White Plains, New York, warned Rudy Giuliani that he should be careful in getting what he wants. Reuters said the judge warned Rudy that if he allows Rudy to keep the $3.5 million home, then the judge said he would be left with no choice but to turn the rest of the bankruptcy over to the Committee of Creditors. That would be all the people Rudy owes money to. The Judge ruled the two election workers, the lawyers Rudy owes money to, the accountants, the other people suing him, they would all be allowed to take draconian steps liquidating everything Rudy owns. I don't think he owns anything. The lawyer representing Rudy's creditors told the judge that Rudy has no right to own a $3.5 million home when he so obviously lacks the assets to pay the people lining up to get what he's what he owes them. Rudy's lawyers told the judge that his bankruptcy, Rudy's bankruptcy, is still in its early stages, and Rudy would like to live in the Florida condo for as long as possible before he has to turn it over. They said he has no place to live. Oh, yes, he does. He's going to have a a place to live. Uh, And we all know where he's going to be living soon. Among the many lawsuits Rudy faces, just in case I haven't reminded you, one of the many lawsuits... Uh, Rudy faces one has been filed by a former female employee who charges Rudy Giuliani with wage theft and rape. In her filing, the woman alleges Rudy forced her to orally gratify him while he talked on the phone to Donald Trump and chomped on Viagra pills. Jeffrey Clark is the Harvard-educated low-level Justice Department attorney picked out of the chorus line by Donald Trump in the waning days of his presidency because Clark was the only lawyer in the entire Justice Department willing to say the 2020 presidential election was stolen. And Trump was planning to appoint Clark acting attorney general in the lead-up to January 6th. Now, should Trump somehow find his way back into the Oval Office, Clark is on the short list to become Attorney General. But there are a couple of problems. He's one of Trump's co-defendants down in Georgia, so he might have to 
serve as attorney general from prison, which may not be a bad idea. We might actually get prison reform that way. And then there's the issue of his law license getting stripped as well. It looks like they're going to strip him of his law license. Uh, That's him in his underwear, by the way. That's how he answered the door when the federal officers served him with a warrant. They made him step outside in his underwear so he, uh, while the government searched his home for evidence of election interference. But uh, this week, uh, the Washington, D.C. bar put him on trial to decide whether or not to take away his law license. So that's another problem uh, with his being appointed attorney general if Donald Trump finds his way into the Oval Office. I'm pretty sure you need a law license to be attorney general. Actually, you probably don't. Jim Jordan, did I ever tell you this? I don't know if I ever mentioned this. Jim Jordan is the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Republican. He went to law school, but he couldn't pass the bar because he's stupid. And yet he's the Republican chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. So if Jim Jordan doesn't have a law license, why should Trump's attorney general have a law license? Uh, Pants would be good, though. I think Jeffrey Clark should be forced to wear pants. The D.C. bar this week held hearings uh, on whether to take Clark's license away. A preliminary ruling was issued by the D.C. Bar's Board of Responsibility. And the D.C. Bar's Board of Responsibility ruled Thursday that after hearing days of testimony, they have concluded that Jeffrey Clark probably violated at least one of its rules of conduct. The Bar's Disciplinary Council is seeking to remove Jeffrey Clark's license. So Jeffrey Clark, very busy. These are very busy people. It's good to re, it's good to stay active. Republican Congressman Paul Gosar and Andy Biggs represent the state of Arizona. Andy Biggs reportedly called the Trump White House days after the January 6th insurrection, begging for a full blanket pardon for his role in all that. Uh, He wasn't given the pardon. Paul Gosar, along with Ted Cruz, uh, they were engaging in the Green Bay sweep, challenging Arizona's election results on January 6th when the proceedings were interrupted and everybody had to take cover so they wouldn't get killed by the January 6th insurrectionists. That's precisely what was going on when they broke into the Capitol. Paul Gosar, congressman from Arizona, was working with Ted Cruz, challenging the election results from Arizona. And there were a slate of false electors that were sent from Arizona. And the Arizona Attorney General has launched an investigation into Arizona's phony elector scheme. There's a grand jury in Arizona. That's bad news for John Eastman and Kenneth Cheesebro. Should also be bad news for Rona McDaniel, the former head of the RNC. Uh, So the phony elector scheme... You know, Republicans in Arizona, just like Republicans in Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, they forged documents that were then sent to Congress on January 6th, falsely claiming they were the duly electors. uh, They were the representatives from their states to the Electoral College. They weren't. It's forgery. It's against the law. Congressman Biggs, Andy Biggs, and Congressman Paul Gosar have reportedly been subpoenaed and have been ordered to testify before an Arizona grand jury to reveal what they knew about the phony elector scheme and what, if any, role they played. 
and all that. I don't know why former RNC chair Rona McDaniel is not uh, being investigated or being asked to testify because everything I read tells me she was instrumental in finding low-level Republicans from those states who were willing to participate in this attack on our democracy. Meanwhile, Peter Navarro, Trump's economic advisor in the White House, is in jail for contempt of Congress, and he's freaking out. He's not having a good time in prison. He is already contacting the Supreme Court, saying, get me out of here. So, you know, we need prison reform. We really do. Uh, One of the reasons the British won't uh, extradite Julian Assange is because of our prisons. They say that our prisons are so bad they worry for Julian Assange's uh, safety. Uh, We have to fix our prisons. But uh, let's wait until (laughs) after Peter Navarro finishes his six-month prison sentence. He's not happy. I've heard things. He is freaking out. Ah, He was big on law and order, right? Peter Navarro, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime, that kind of crap. Big law and order guy. We need to fix our prisons, but not until after Peter Navarro gets out. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed any of this, please hit the like button. That's the best way for for me to remain in your feed. If you want to help me, please share this with like-minded people uh, by copying and pasting the link to this episode. This is an audio podcast, so take me where... Wherever you go, uh, listen to me on your next drive. Thank you to Bob in the chat room. Thank you to everybody in the chat room. Make sure to leave a co- I read all your comments. And if you're a Republican, I delete all your comments. You'll notice this is a MAGA free zone. So leave a comment. Uh, I read all of them and I delete all the Republican comments. Uh, comments. Please subscribe to this channel. Please watch Ethan Hershenfeld. He's on YouTube now at 9 p.m. seven nights a week. Subscribe to Ethan's channel. Thank you. I'm going to do a show Saturday night with the old camera. Thank you for watching.